There is a quote that says, "Wisdom lies not in seeing things, but seeing through things." This quote is so apt as I introduce my guest for this new episode of Wisdom Personified Conversations with Dudum Somi. When you listen to his refreshing and wise analysis of politics and the political economy in South Africa on our broadcast media or read his articles, it is evident he not only sees things but also through them as well. Angela Fick is the director of research at Arwal Socioeconomic Research Institute. Angela, thank you for making time for us today. It's a pleasure to be participating in this process. What were your pastimes as a child? How did you spend your days? Do you have siblings? Uh, childhood is a very long time ago, <laughs> so <laughs> one remembers it in all sorts of idealized ways. I think as a child, um, I was kind of preoccupied with imaginative play, which sometimes involved toys and sometimes didn't. And then when I could start reading, the imaginative play shifted into reading um, other people's books, um, other people's stories, other people's ideas. Yes, there are siblings. We're all terribly intent on our privacy, um, you know, learn from our parents. Uh, that publicity isn't really an achievement, that being in the public eye um, is an accident of what it is you're actually doing. And so um, I'm constantly teased and was by my parents, particularly when they were still alive, um, about this business of doing things in the public eye when really what I was at the time was an ordinary university teacher. And so, yes, childhood probably mostly um, imaginative play with and without toys, with or without uh, blocks, with and without little menageries of plastic animals. <laughs> Sounds kind of similar. <laughs> um, what do you think your unique value proposition is? Uh, what makes you memorable and impactful? I mean, what are those qualities? I can imagine what I would say, but I'm curious to know what you think of yourself. Um, I don't really think of myself in those terms. Um, I think my sort of most valuable role in life so far has been that of and public role um, with other people who are not one's um, family or one's immediate circle would be the role of a teacher, which I did for 20 years. Um, and so the ability to explain, to help others understand something, those have been central roles in my life. Um, and they've also been central to my learning about the world because there's the famous adage that uh, the person who comes to teaching learns more than the person who comes to learn. And so education, uh, my role in education as a teacher, um, facilitated my role as a researcher in, in a different domain. Um, and all sorts of relationships stemmed from that role as a teacher with people who used to be colleagues, people who used to be students, who are now friends or acquaintances in a larger network. And so I suppose the thing that makes me most significantly me um, in the lives of people who aren't related to me uh, would be my sort of work as a teacher. Mm. And just um, touching on the research part, you are a director um, of research at Alwal Socioeconomic Research Institute. What does ASHRI do? So the Owl Socioeconomic Research Institute is a very small non-profit organization. Um, what it does is research into inequality, questions of social justice that affects ordinary South Africans. Some of that work then leads to advocacy. And then its main project over the last few years um, have been um, or has been a, a program that tries to take young people who are university graduates um, and before they go to into the workplace, before they go into that terrible marketplace of employment, we try and give them um, a 16-week to year-long uh, leadership course. And this is a civic leadership course that attempts to, among other things, inculcate into them a sense of civic ethical responsibility, but also um, give them a sense of what the landscape is in terms of the architecture of the state, the role of government, the role of the civil society sector, um, and the role that uh, we have to play as actors dedicated towards a better South Africa and a better world um, in whatever function we're going to have as um, future uh, employed people, professionals, adults, um, people who will be working as citizens of the world, not just of the country. And so that is, I think, one of its key projects 
um, that is headed by my colleague, uh, Ibrahim Fakir. I think uh, some of us who are already seasoned professionals and politicians could also benefit from this leadership training, I think. But, you know, um, thinking of race relations and gender um, in South Africa, what are your main concerns are, are around those issues? So somebody who's been looking at these questions for, it sounds absurd to say it, but almost 30 years, um, one of my concerns is that the we don't really have a discourse, a public debate, a public domain discussion that is led by the people who've studied it the most. And I don't mean myself, I mean scholars um, like Desiree Lewis or Pumla Gola or, you know, somebody like Zemito Erasmus at the University of the Advertisement. Uh, we are led in these discussions by people who are much more opportunistic politicians or much more exploitative uh, private business people often. Um, who have profit motives rather than the longer term of the society's stability and survival. Uh, we also have a public education system that I think very poorly prepares very ordinary South Africans for the realities of this. So critically literate, scientifically rational education um, has suffered very much in the post-apartheid era. And that is something that we can't blame the previous dispensation for. It's something that we have to hold our elected governors to account. But it's something we also have to hold ourselves as members of society to account. We've allowed, and I think partly the thrall of um, social media and public platforms of that kind allow for this as well, for the dissemination of information that isn't really reliable. Um, so what we have is a glut of information on questions of race, questions of gender, sexuality, but much of that information is actually highly unreliable and, and deeply suspicious. It has almost no scientific validity. And this makes it very difficult for people who aren't getting the requisite critically literate or critical literate skills in schools um, to distinguish between the kinds of information that is out there and what status they have. Uh, and this is not to surrender ourselves to a culture of expertise, but it is to um, value the people who've spent 20 to 30 years looking at problems in a rational, ordered way, and mostly funded by taxpayers' money because our public universities are subsidized by the state. To ignore all of that information is, for me, not just ridiculous, it's actually perilous, as we've seen in other societies. Um, we wouldn't do this, or I, a year ago, I would have said, we wouldn't do this with a scientific problem. We would listen to scientists. So if the well in the village or the town has been poisoned, we wouldn't necessarily take a vote on how we're going to proceed with it. Where we'll get the hydrologists, we will get the chemists, we will get the people who know what they're doing to, you know, diagnose the problem, suggest ways forward. And we would certainly have input as citizens. But the fact that anybody who can think of themselves as having a race and whatever that implies or uh, having a gender feels the ability to, one, speak out about it as if they're an expert and, two, be listened to and amplified on public media platforms yeah. um, is a more societal problem than it is an individual problem. Which leads me so perfectly into the next question that I wanted to ask. Um, you have a master's... Uh, of arts in English language and literature. I posit that uh, literary studies can facilitate critical thinking and reasoning. Do you concur? And why do you think that is? So absolutely, I think the humanities more generally is a valuable component of any kind of critically literate education for a citizen. And that humanities education shouldn't necessarily begin only in university. It should really be there from the formative years of early childhood development and its um, education component. Uh, I think reading is a very crucial part of, in late modernity, having a critical relationship to the world. And that I don't mean just a negative relationship. I mean a positive, productive relationship about understanding the world in terms that are complex, not just um, for profit or for individual advancement or advantage. And... I'm lucky to have studied literature in a time and in a place and with people um, who stress the worldliness of reading, who stress the relationship between reading a book and living in the world in which you're reading that book. Um, my most crucial example would be an honours seminar in the early 1990s, in fact, in 1993, which was technically about the development of the 18th century novel um, in England. But really, because we were reading it in 1993, um, the very last year of paranoid apartheid South African um, violence, 
Uh, the seminar series overlapped with the assassination of Chris Hani, and the person who ran the seminar, uh, John Kutsia, immediately started making us think about the relationship between the construction of race in South Africa in the traditions of these 18th century novels and the refusal because of the Dutch history, because of Protestantism, and because of the specificities of South African colonial experience, um, of that kind of fellow feeling that had developed in Northwestern Europe, European Protestantism and its perversion in the Southern African landscape, which would lead to the kind of conflagrations of late colonial South Africa and apartheid South Africa. And so this was important for us that we weren't just reading these 1748 novels um, as if we were reading them on the moon. We were reading them as people sitting in South Africa during a particular historical moment. And I think that kind of reading, what the Palestinian-American critic Edward Said called worlding the text, um, so that you read the text, but you also read yourself reading that text and understanding why it is you're reading, the way in which you're reading it. Um, is something that's very crucial. And I'm not certain that that moment persists in literary studies in South Africa, um, because so much um, posturing is going on in and around the academy, not least because so much pressure is put on academics to produce and produce things for profit. So publishing for profit, teaching for profit, um, in a way that really stymies the intellectual enterprise that will produce the kind of citizens we desperately need in South Africa. Um, and this is not a new idea. Somebody as long ago um, as 120 years ago, W.E.B. Du Bois, the African-American thinker, indicated that what was needed by Black Americans was not just a university that produced uh, people who could do the professional tasks of a capitalist society, but people who could reflect on the nature of that society and change it for the better of everybody, not just themselves. And that's a vision that I think we desperately need to return uh, to the mainstream in university education in South Africa so that it doesn't get reduced to merely training people for economic needs that are perceived to be short-term gains for the society and or the mandarins of the society, because I think that would be a disfavor not only to the young people of today, but to the people who have to inherit a society that will be imperiled not just by its own dynamics, but by a global um, peril, which is the climate emergency and its consequences for all 7.8 billion people currently alive. Wow. Yeah. I was actually actually thinking of um, the way one studied, whether it was Shakespeare or Achebe. Um, and I mean, I also majored in English, but I didn't go up to master's level. But honestly, reading things fall apart or devil on the cross or things like that, they really made me understand our world better, made me understand myself as an African, made me understand my values, the cultures, you know, things like that. So, you know, English literature, I think, has so much more to 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 give the world than we, we, we are gaining from it at the moment. Maybe then, maybe if more of us actually did humanities, uh, we'll be able to answer this, but I'll ask you this. How do you think individuals can, afford, can avoid falling for conspiracy theories? Is there a way of spotting a conspiracy theory? So this takes me back to um, the point about critically literate education. Um, so in his dying years, the Palestinian-American professor of literature and um, political analyst, uh, Edward Said, uh, indicated that if we don't introduce that kind of education as early as possible, we run the risk of having a world populated by people who are enthralled, who are simply at the mercy of um, tyrants of people, whether they're tyrants of politics or tyrants of um, multinational global um, organizations or uh, corporations who can determine for them what they understand the world to be. And we're seeing that live in action every day in South Africa. Uh, the way in which people respond, for example, to the vaccination debate, uh, the ways in which we have politicians who are really just the front men and women for multinational corporations and make decisions that really benefit unaccountable people, people who are not elected, and in the interests of those people, rather than in the interests of the people who elect them um, or vote for them or support them or can criticize them. 
And here Noam Chomsky uh, has a metaphor that he says he encountered uh, in India among peasants when he said, you know, as an anarchist, he didn't believe that the state should be as centralized as it is. And they said to him, yes, we don't believe it either, but a centralized strong state is better than a weak state in the environment we live in. Because in a strong state, the state is a prison. But if there is a, you know, human-eating tiger roaming outside the, the prison, uh, you would want the prison walls and bars to be quite strong. And multinational global capital is that tiger. It does eat up people um, in metaphorical ways that are quite disturbing, as we've just seen with uh, the Global North's response to the pandemic, hoarding the vaccines, uh, putting limits on the export of vaccine ingredients, uh, limiting third world countries' ability to manufacture their own vaccines and meet their needs. And so what we're seeing is if we have a strong state, the state, as imprisoning as it can be, can protect us from organizations and, and entities that are much more dangerous to our being because they can't be replaced. You can't vote them out and you can't overthrow them. And so a critically literate education from the ages of six and seven, if not earlier, would be useful to produce the kinds of young people and later adults who don't have to be who don't have to rely on other people to point out to them that something doesn't cohere logically, who would have that ability for themselves and would then be able to not just be consumers of the next available smart product or the next available fancy item or the next status symbol, but will be able to put that status symbol into context with no that buying yet another device is to poison women in Thailand uh, who have to work with this. It is to engender the kind of child slavery we've seen um, that underlies the coffee industry, that underlies the uh, precious minerals industry in Central Africa, that has caused, um, the, you know, among other things, two great wars in, in Central Africa that cost millions of people their lives. And so this kind of ability to think beyond yourself is important. And here, to go back to your point about literature, one thinks of James Baldwin, uh, the African-American writer and thinker who said, you think something happens to you and you are unique. And then you read and you realize it's happened to other people and it's happening to other people in your time. And here you've mentioned Achebe's work. Um, one thinks of not just um, things fall apart, but no longer at ease or um, a man of the people. And you realize that for us in South Africa, we had a head of state and a head of government who stood in front of an audience on a university campus and said, we are not like other Africans generally. And the irony was to have said that on a university campus where there is an African literature department, where if you've read any of the African writers, Ngugi Wathiongo, Najib Mahfouz, Nawal El Sa'ahdawi, um, even writers from just across the border, like Chenjirai Hobe um, or Charles Mangoshi, you would realize we are like other Africans generally. And we didn't heed the warnings of actual living Africans in 2008 who said to us, the xenophobic violence that you're seeing in your country now, we've got experience of it, and this is what's going to happen next. And that is precisely what happened and continues to happen. If you read No Longer at Ease, if you read Nervous Conditions, um, if you read Flora Nwapa um, or Bushi and Mesheta, um, you realize that our society is not that unique. And if you read off the continent, you would also be able to see through the story that is being told to us by our governors that says, no, no, we have colonialism of a special kind. Um, and you realize we don't, that most of the Latin American continent has the same kind of colonialism, where those who colonized didn't go back, they stayed and they governed for a long time. Um, and Bolivia is the prime example of how long it took for the indigenous to come back to governance. And, and that kind of reading comparatively to place oneself not as unique or special or as an exception is to place yourself and replace yourself in the human experience and thereby gain the ability to not have others tell you how to think about yourself, which is what we see young people struggle with every day in South Africa. I must say when we talk about reading, because sometimes when... Um people say that uh, especially African people don't read. Uh, but isn't it also important what you read and how do you find the right things to read? Because you, you can be Googling all day 
and reading, but it may not be anything of substance that actually helps your critical thinking and reasoning. So I think sometimes the question of what to read for me is just as significant as reading. And also how to read, because I am also somebody who reads a lot of internet stuff, and a lot of it is, you know, to use the phrase that some people would use, trash. But it is entertaining and amusing trash, but it, I'm aware of what its limitations are. Yeah. And that's because I've been taught, and not just at university, but by teachers in primary school, by a family that read to read differently, to read in a way that I don't just think anything that's on the printed page or on the screen is necessarily true, that I take a position in relation to it. I compare it with other sources that I have on it. Um, and here I think religious education has a role to play. Um, you know, that when we dispense with religious education, we dispense with a certain kind of relationship to text, with a certain kind of relationship to understanding and comparison, uh, regardless of the tradition of the religion, whether it is Judaism, whether it is um, any of the Judaic religions or the religions that come out of that tradition and respond to it, including Islam and Christianity, or whether it is um, the Hindu religion or the Buddhist religion or, you know, Taoism or Confucianism. The written traditions are there. Um, and increasingly, even for animist African traditions, there are written texts that are relied upon and that people exchange. Um, and that it is important for us to teach children to not just read to believe, um, but to read to interrogate. And children are naturally very good at this. If you've ever read a children's story to a child, they have more questions between every sentence and about every picture. Um, and it is, I think, tragically, the formal education system's lack of good quality that trains that out of children. Because if you read a children's book to a three-year-old or a two-year-old or a four-year-old, they're constantly interrupting you, wanting to know answers to questions that you wouldn't have thought necessary to the reading experience. And that's, I think, a very valuable trait as human beings that we possess, that we need to nurture and extend the life of and reintroduce to people who've been actively trained and formally educated to let go of it. Which brings me nicely to this question that I had for you. You say that children should be an essential component of our lives, even those who choose not to have their own children. What value do children add to our lives as human beings? Firstly, children introduce humility into your life. Um, if you've ever had to argue with or confront the argument of a four or five-year-old about why they should or shouldn't go to bed at a certain hour, you realize just how powerless you can be, uh, despite <laughs> your delusion as an adult that you're in control. Um, but it is also the curiosity of children, um, the process of watching them learn. And this, this can happen to you if you're just responsible for a child for half an hour to an hour. And I think this is why so many people who go into teaching love teaching children in a way that some of us can't. I mean, I can't imagine myself in control of 34 little bodies for longer than two minutes before I would call the parents to come pick them up. <laughs> and so I salute and value um, people who are pediatric nurses, people who work in early childhood development, because it is a skill. Um, and it's not just, it's a skill that's been feminized in our society. So we often fob this work off onto women. But again, uh, this is something that adult men would learn much about themselves about if they spent time with children um, and being responsible for them um, in ways that aren't just about material well-being, but in responding to their questions, in listening to and beginning to understand why somebody who hasn't been um, in our society as long as we as adults have been would continue to have the kinds of questions that they have. Because children have a natural sense of justice if they grow up in healthy environments, they have a natural sense of equality, um, and these are things that we could learn from them. And children can be exasperated, but part of that exasperation that they introduce to us or that they induce in us and evoke in us is essential for human life because it would suddenly allow us and give us the skills to cope with why things are not working in the supermarket queue or why things are not working as effectively as we imagine they should. Uh, the train that doesn't arrive on time, the plane that doesn't take off on time, um, the fact that something that you thought was booked for you, for example, a seat on a plane, isn't there anymore. So instead of throwing a tantrum in the airport, you realize this is what a child does who doesn't understand why these things happen. And I, as an adult, can explain to myself as if I were that child and yeah. horse whisper my tantrum throwing roll on the floor, 
in front of the airline queue because the woman behind the counter isn't really responsible for this. She's part of a larger system. And so childlike observance and being with children um, is, a, they offer lessons in humility, lessons in understanding, and lessons in why it is important to remain curious because children's curiosity is often what can save one from being too complacent in a world that needs much more change because children spot the injustice much more quickly than adults do and they don't have the experience to rationalize it away, explain it away um, and, and simply get on with life. It worries them, it perturbs them and they're not happy until they have an adequate answer, which is a quality we as adults would have it would be very useful um, in everyday civic life in relation to our politicians, um, but also in relation to everyday life in our families, in our friendship circles and in our places of work. Yeah, I must say, as you're talking, I'm remembering my father. Um, I, there was a time when he was smoking in the car and I was in the car, I was very young. And then I said, why don't you just give me the cigarettes so that I can smoke it myself and save you um, the difficulty of poisoning your own child. I think my father like turned and looked at me. He never again smoked in my presence. So now that you think about it, I was like, as a child, how the heck did I even think to say something like that? But he never again smoked in my presence. Um, and I think he, he actually didn't smoke much after that. What is your biggest insecurity? Um, I suppose it is the insecurity that many other people have, which is, um, it is absurd to say this in given what's behind me, but it's material insecurity. We live increasingly in a world of precarious existence. You know, I am the child of people who could have lifelong careers and lifelong jobs. Most people my age now do not have that ability to have a lifelong career or a lifelong job um, because employment has become precarious. And we in the middle classes are still fortunate. Um, working class people and, and peasant people in South Africa, and I mean that in the technical sense, not as an insult, have much greater precarity. Um, if the person decides today that the farm that they own will no longer be doing pineapple farming, um, but will be doing game farming because it's more profitable and it's less labor intensive, everybody who's working on that farm, they have to figure out what they're going to do next to survive. Um, we in the middle classes have had to do this for the last 20 years or so in South Africa, change careers, change jobs. Um, and, and it's easier for us to do so because we're skilled in particular ways and we have more options available to us. But that precarity is something that looms significantly in the lives of people every day in South Africa, um, whether they are journalists, whether they're university academics, whether they're teachers. Um, the idea that you had a job for life and that you could stick with it uh, yeah. offered great security and prevented people from having to worry uh, about additional things to the things you have to worry about as a human being who exists in a, a very dangerous and precarious world. So not only do you have to worry about cancer, your health, the health of your children, your parents, your loved ones, um, crime, violence, you also have to worry about whether you will have a job in 2022, whether you will have a job at the end of 2021. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, adds an additional measure of anxiety in an anxiety-ridden world. And so my great insecurity would be that, will I be able to provide? And it sounds silly, um, but it is, it is a significant component of the lives of people every day. And it's not just an accident. It is part of the design of the political system we live in. It is to the benefit of the few that the many have this precarity. Anybody who's ever been in a human resources um, disciplinary hearing, um, whether it is for a media company or any other corporation will know this. But the point of human resources isn't really to protect the employee, it's to protect the company, its profits and its captains of industry. And this, this creates the kind of unease where people would rather play along like good Germans in the 1930s to grace, disgraceful and gross injustices than to stand up, because to stand up is to risk, and as journalists have found out, um, and sometimes teachers, um, and sometimes people in other professions, not just your job in that company, but your employability altogether in an industry that you may want to have some kind of dedication to, because it provides you with a certain kind of satisfaction and self-achievement and self-realization. And that, I think, is a great difficulty. Insecurity around employment, insecurity around precarity of existence beyond merely the usual 
dreads of will I die, will I get ill, um, it's increasing, will I be able to afford to pay for the very basics in my life and the lives of the people who depend on me. Yeah, it's very, it's really hard hitting times. Um, have you lived your best life so far? I don't know. I think that's really something that I don't think about. I'm content. I have moments of happiness. But the best life, there is always, um, you know, there's the cliche, the life worth living is the wild life that you've um, contemplated upon and thought about. And I'm hopefully at 48, only halfway through, um, having had parents that lived into their 80s and 90s. Um, but I think I can be content and respect the choices that I've made. There are fewer regrets than there are satisfactions. Um, and that, I think, is, is a measure for me coming out of the ethical and religious thinking traditions of my parents and, and extended family, uh, a good place to be. And I think that kind of contentment is something that we need to, again, inculcate in people. That it, You don't have to have been excellent. You don't have to have been the best of anything. You can be content with what you've done if you can ethically reflect that what you've done and the choices you've made have been more to the good of people other than yourself um, and less to the bad. Because we're all capable of mistakes, sometimes horrendous mistakes that make yeah. other people's lives much more difficult. Um, but to be more like the people who've left the room better than when they entered it, than to be the kind of people who left the world in shards and ruins having departed. So I don't know what the analogy would be, but I suppose better to have been the anonymous teacher in a primary school who taught thousands of kids to read than to have been, I don't know, Adolf Hitler, who influenced millions of people, but not necessarily for the good. Um, and, and that, I think, is, is all that we can wish for. Yeah. Before we close, because I can go on, gosh, you're such an interesting human being. If there is anything that you hope you will not die before doing, what is that? Oh, that's difficult because <laughs> um, there are some personal goals that one has that yeah. involve people that you love, that you would want to see grow up, succeed, um, enjoy adulthood of a certain kind and make discoveries that they don't have at the moment because they're still teenagers or children. Um, and then there are books you would still want to read because, you know, you haven't got hold of a copy of them. Um, and, you know, there are filmmakers whose films I would want to see before I die and they're still active. So there are people alive who are producing great art, whether it's written or visual or film art, who I would regret if I knew I was dying that I wasn't going to see the next Pedro Almodovar film or I wasn't going to get to my friend Pumla Glola's next book or I wasn't going to see someone finish high school, which she's, you know, within three years of doing. Um, because it's that those little regrets of human achievement rather than, oh, I wouldn't have achieved X or Y or Z myself. Yeah. Um, I don't have that kind of... I mean, I have a healthy ego, some would say, overly healthy, but I don't have that kind of, shall we say, egomania where I go, I'd like to have become prime minister of a country or <laughs> yeah. head of a this or that title. Those are not for me achievements. Uh, my achievements are much more about being there to see myself as a witness to certain kinds of events and pleasures and joys um, that I don't think I have yet achieved uh, as a human being. Wow. rather than, um, and that, that's not nobility speaking, that's selfishness. Yeah. I mean, to want to stay alive, to watch somebody else um, write their first book is incredibly selfish because you want them to stay alive to do it for you, which is also <laughs> very selfish. Um, but yeah, so there are those kinds of things I would have as last minute regrets rather yeah. than um, I'd like to have been X or Y or Z. Yeah, interesting. In closing, um, what wisdom would you like to leave us with? Um, and not to be overly dramatic, if this was the last interview. <laughs> the last interview, that's actually the title of a two and a half hour long talk with Edward Said uh, a month before he actually died oh, because he no. had leukemia and knew he was dying. Okay. Um, and I couldn't possibly measure up to what he had to say. I don't have wisdom to impart. Um, I only have a wish, yep. which is not just to be kind to people, 
but to hold people to account in you know terms of that kindness um, and to hold people with power to account because it is the only way we are going to survive as a species we are at the final emergency of our civilization and the test of our um, ability to the test for us is our ability to meet the needs of this emergency the climate emergency and its consequences in the political and social realms um because if we want our children and our children's children to see 2100 that year we're going to have to act fast um because we don't have much time and um the selfishness of self actualization has to give way to the larger project i think um of species survival in a form that's vaguely like the one we know now because there is no planet b and there is no option b it's all of us together or none of us at all and that's that's not even my own wisdom but it's the one i trust in wow thank you so much angelo really um such a privilege always being in your space well thank you so much for um facilitating this and and thinking of me for this series to which i feel entirely inadequate to having seen some of the other episodes there we are folks hope you concur that angelo fick is a wise african that we can all be inspired by. If you would like to receive notifications when a new episode is available on our YouTube channel, click the subscribe button and the bell notification icon so that you are the first to know. Until next time, on Wisdom Personified Conversations with Didum Somin.